You now have the freedom to open your Bibles. Psalm 119. As we continue our journey through this psalm, we'll be reading and studying verses 33 through 48 today. Let's rise. It's a sign of respect of God's word. Hear now his word. Teach me, O Lord, the ways of your statutes, and I will keep it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from learning, looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. Confirm your, to your servant your promise that you may be feared. Turn away the reproach that I dread, for your rules are good. Behold, I long for your precepts, and your righteousness give me life. Let your steadfast love come to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your promise. Then shall I have an answer for him who taunts me, for I trust in your word. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for my hope is in your rules. I will keep your law continually forever and ever, and I shall walk in a high place, a wide place, for I have sought your precepts. I will also speak your testimonies before kings and shall not be put to shame, for I find my delight in your commandments, which I love. I will lift up my hands toward your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this gift of your word. Sometimes the Psalms have much to teach us intellectually, but a lot of times it has a lot to teach us emotionally, through the feeling, through the passion of the word. And we see a passion for your word, your truth, your guidelines, your commandments today. Renew in our heart a desire and a passion for you. Lord, let us never take you for granted. Let us never take the privilege of reading your word for granted. In your name, amen. I was reading about a college boy and a college girl that were taking a feminist theory class together. And they, uh, you know those classes, a lot, of, a lot of calm, rational discussion. So naturally, they got into an argument. And the guy said, well, women are pointless without men. After all, where would Juliet be without Romeo? And the woman said she was speechless with rage. And she didn't know what to say. And she, she went home. And later that day, she's like, oh, I thought of the perfect thing to say. Where would Juliet be without Romeo? She'd be alive. That's where she'd be. I should have said that. Isn't it, there's nothing more maddening than coming up with a perfect reply like five hours after somebody says something to you. My French isn't great, but they have a phrase that, that they call the staircase wit, which is you're really good at thinking of comebacks when you're on your way down the stairs from the place you were just visiting. Now, I think that's, that's kind of consolation to us. This is like a near universal experience that we kind of think of comebacks long after we should have said them. Well, Jesus does not require us, thank goodness, to be quick-witted masters of the comeback, but he does tell us to be ready at any moment to share our testimony. You never know when somebody might come up to you and either attack your faith or ask you about your faith. And in those moments, you need to have a reply ready. 1 Peter 3.15 says, Always be prepared to make a defense for anyone who asks you for a reason of the hope that's in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. I like that last bit, by the way. Gentleness and respect when you're responding. Because after all, you don't want to sit there with your mouth open. Somebody just asks you, why are you a Christian? And you just go, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, I don't know. And then you think of a great response when you're walking down the stairs afterwards. You don't want that. You need to be ready at any moment, any hour, to stand up for your hope in Christ. And this author of Psalm 119, I think, helps us prepare a perfect comeback for that time that you don't know when will happen, but will happen in your life. He says, people will attack my faith. People will question my faith. I need to be ready to defend it. This passage encourages us to do the same so that we won't be like a deer in headlights when somebody asks you, why do you have a faith in Jesus Christ? Now, my son Benji, who was just up here, he loves a good joke. 
I don't think I've ever seen anybody really love jokes the way he does. He buys joke books, and he will pour over them, and he will study them, and he will memorize them, so that at any moment of any day, if he has that opportunity, he'll just come out with a joke. Usually he waits until I've got a mouthful of something, so I just spit it out because I'm laughing so hard. But he does. He comes out with great jokes. Like, why, did, why, did the, uh, why do you buy handguns from a T-Rex? Because he's my small arms dealer. Uh. <laughs> As a dad, I appreciate good dad joke. But this is what he does. He studies over his joke books, memorizes them, and then looks for opportunities to use those jokes. And that's what we should be doing as well. Not with joke books. Some of you are not good with jokes. That's OK. I'm not that great either. But we should be doing that with scripture. The psalmist here, he's hardcore dedicated to soaking up the scripture and storing it up like you would if you were a battery. He prays in verse 33, teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will keep it. I will store it up until the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my own heart, my whole heart. Because once again, we see the psalmist kind of admitting there's only so much he can do, and the rest he has to depend on God. He can read the scriptures on his own. He can study them, but to truly understand them, he needs God. He needs to depend on God to do that. And you can actually see a kind of a, a example of this in the Gospels if we look at the disciples. If we look at the disciples in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what do we see? We see 12 men who are largely ignorant. They're studying under the master. They are hearing his words every day, and they don't get it. They don't usually understand what's being said. It doesn't really soak into their lives. Instead, if they remember it at all, it's usually to get it wrong. And you think Jesus would just walk away from that, but rather he says, guys, you're not hopeless, because he says in John 14, these things I have spoken to you, while I am still with you, but later the helper, who is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your memory all that I have said to you. Jesus says, but the Spirit teaches. Jesus says, but the Spirit helps you remember. And so we see the kind of the before picture in these disciples. And that's the same thing right here that the psalmist is saying with Psalm 119. He says, I want to learn and I want to understand. I've read these words, but I don't get it the way I want to get it. I don't truly understand it. I need you to unlock the key of these passages for me. I need the Holy Spirit to help me store up and understand this scripture in my heart. Well, when you go from the Gospels, where the disciples are bumbling around, they're not really getting it. But then you go to the book of Acts, you see what happens after they receive the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Well, suddenly there's this tr radical transformation in their lives. These men, they haven't gone to a 10-week course. They haven't suddenly graduated with some diploma. They just have the Spirit come into their life. And now, all of a sudden, they're able to recall all of these teachings. And not just recall them, they're able to teach them. They're able to get up there and deliver sermons. They start Bible studies. They're passionate about the Word of God. They're getting it right now. What's the only thing that's changed? It's not them. It's the Spirit that's come into their life. And the crowds are astonished to hear them. There's some hope for us. No matter how smart you think you are or how hopeless you feel you are some days, the Spirit can come into your life and help you remember what you've been taught and help you truly understand it. So on the day, on the opportunity that you need to be sharing your faith, God will give you that understanding so you can go back and share it with other people. The Spirit will do that for you. Well, as a soldier always checks his rifle to make sure that it's loaded, always checks his canteen to make sure it's full, Christians need to be looking at our own life and say, well, where am I on stored up scripture? Am I very meager? Is, is my ammunition clip almost bare? Do I only have one or two bullets there? Or am I full up? Am I ready? Are you ready for the day that maybe somebody even attacks you for your faith? 
Now, when that happens, you have, a, you have a natural response, a sinful response, which is what? To respond in anger. Oh, somebody's attacking me. I need to get in their face. I need to get angry back at them. But remember, 1 Peter says, gentleness and respect, that we are to share our faith. We are to look at that as an opportunity to testify to somebody, even as they attack us. The psalmist knows that that's going to happen right there in verse 42. He says, I know that sooner or later, somebody will attack me for loving and knowing God. So he asks God, he prays to God, verses 38 and 41. He says, Lord, confirm to your servant your promise. Bring your steadfast love to me, your salvation according to your promise. We see that word promise again and again in this psalm. What's that referring to? We're going all the way back to the first two verses, the blessings. Remember how we started out these two great blessings that he didn't qualify for, but he gets anyways because of the grace of God? Those blessings contain inherent promises. He says, Lord, remember those promises. Remember the promise of the forgiveness of sins. Remember the promise of eternal life. Remember the promise of the inheritance in the kingdom of God. All these great things you've promised to me. Don't forget, rather, Lord, deliver them to me so that when people try to attack me saying, you know, God doesn't, isn't faithful to you, God doesn't remember you, they'll look at my life and see how much you've brought that blessing and brought that promise into my life and they'll be proven a liar. That's kind of how kids do when they attack each other on the playground. And it's a cruel, cruel thing that they do, but I've seen it so many times, where children will t attack other kids by saying, your mom and dad don't really love you. Have you seen this happen? They did, they'll do it, oh, your mom wouldn't love you. Look at you, look how ugly you are. Look how the kind of person you are. Your dad doesn't even think about you. They try to, they try to undermine that parent-child relationship. And so they try to strike in some fear, strike some doubt. And that kid on the playground is feeling attacked, is starting to think, maybe my mom and dad doesn't love me. Maybe I'm all alone on myself. Maybe I'm just fooling myself into thinking that they love me more than they actually do. Well, what's the response there? The response is to laugh and to point and say, wait a second. Look at all the ways my mom and dad do love me. Look at all the ways they sacrifice for me. You're just lying to my face. They love me. I have proof of that love. That's what the psalmist is saying here. Lord, show me proof of your love so that I can turn around and say to all the naysayers, look at how much my God loves me. You're just lying to my face. Because this is the very first tactic that Satan will do in your life is try to undermine your relationship with God. Try to make you doubt whether or not God loves you, especially when you mess up, especially when you sin. Then Satan's there like, ha! see, why would God love you? You just did that thing, that disgusting, abhorrent thing. He wouldn't love you. He doesn't really keep his promises in the Bible. He just does that to the good people. But you're not one of the good people. Maybe he doesn't love you after all. In response to that, we are to take those stored up scriptures that we have been faithfully, hopefully, putting into our lives, and now we're going to be slinging them back as Satan, one at a time, using that sword of truth, and take it back to him. Back when I was in youth group, we had a game that we would do, kind of more of an exercise. But I would give the children, I'd give the teens a list of verses I say, okay, we're going to do some role play. Here's the verses. Here's your ammunition. Here's your weapons today, your sword of truth. Now I'm going to give you a situation. I want you to read down this list and tell me what verse should you be saying in response to that situation. So, for example, I might say, role playing wise, I might say, well, you can go to heaven by believing in anything. You don't really have to believe in Jesus. You can believe in anything you want as long as you're a good person. Well, then they would look down that list and somebody would fire back and say, no, John 14, 6 says, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So I'm trying to teach them to refute the lies of the world with the truth of the Bible. Another example might be like our playground example. Somebody comes up to you and says, you're a loser. No one would love you. And you would look down that list and say, no, 
Romans 8, 37 says, I am more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ who loves me. I'm more than a victor. So storing up these verses is all well and good, but on those days we need to use them. Don't be afraid to quote scripture. It's, it's the best possible defense you possibly could summon up against the lies of the world. Use scripture to defend yourself when you find yourself under attack for your faith. But it isn't just faith that's put on trials for lies. Sometimes, quite often, it's, our faith is a conversation starter. It's something that set you apart, and sooner or later, people got to ask about it. Like, why are you this way? Why do you still follow the writings of some 2,000-year-old guy who lived a long time ago and wrote this stuff? Why, why are you like this? And on those days, you shouldn't be scared. You should go, thank you, God, because now I have an opportunity to share my faith. Because there's something very striking about a person who's been liberated from their own guilt, liberated from their own sin, and they start living in a way that's free, and everybody around them starts noticing, go, what's up with Bob? Seriously, why is this guy this happy when the world is this sad? I gotta ask him about his faith. So uh, in verse 45, a phrase that really popped out at me is the psalmist says, I shall walk in the wide place for I have taught your precepts. Now, just if I say the phrase, I'm walking in the wide place, don't overthink it. What comes to your mind? What is he trying to express here? Walking in the wide place. Well, what is he not saying? I'm not walking in the confined space, the cramped space. I'm walking with freedom. I'm walking with liberty. I'm walking with my arms swinging out to the sides, my hips swinging. I'm walking without constriction. Nothing's getting in my way. I'm walking in the wide place. Why am I this free? Why am I this loose? Because of my faith, because of God's word and his promises that I now believe and I have trust in. God's word freed the writer to walk in the wide places. And he frees you. He gives you that. If you feel constrained by your sin, by your guilt, by the expectations of a world that's always telling you, do this. No, today, no, do this. Now, tomorrow, do that. Now, you've got to do this to be right. No, now, you've got to do that. Instead, you can just go, no, I'm choosing to follow the precepts of God instead. And I'm free. I'm free to do the right thing. God's goodness and his wisdom are so much of a better replacement for old anxiety and habits and worldly goals. And as we walk free on the wide paths, we're going to get noticed and we're going to get asked about that freedom. So we got to have a response. The author says, I will also speak of your testimonies before kings, and I shall not on that day be put to shame. I shall speak of your testimonies before kings. Kings. Even in the most high pressure environments, the person who is free in Christ is excited to have that opportunity to speak about him. Going back to our example with the apostles, after that, they had this radical transformation in Acts, we see one place in Acts chapter 4, one of the best examples of how radically they have been changed. The apostles had healed a crippled man. And after that, they were preaching up and down the streets of Jerusalem. Well, the religious authorities, they said, we can't have that. So they arrested uh, Peter and James and all of them. They bring them in. They haul the apostles into courts in chains and say, well, you need to defend yourself, explain yourself. Why are you talking all this, this nonsense? And put yourself in their shoes that you've just been arrested. Now all your supporters all the rest of your church, they're on the outside of the walls. In here, in this room, you are surrounded by people who are angry with you. People who have power over you. People who could just throw you into the deepest pit and keep you there for the rest of your life. You should be quivering in your chains. You should be trying to downplay it, trying to go, oh, let's, let's, find a, let's agree to disagree or let's find a happy compromise. But that's not what happens here. Because the apostles knew the truth of Jesus' words in Matthew 10. When Jesus said, when, not if, when they deliver you over, do not be anxious about how you are to speak, what you are to say, 
For what you will say will be given to you in that hour. Who's going to give you those words? For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks through you. In that day, when you go, I don't know what I'm going to say. I, I think a lot of us would say that right now. Somebody's going to come up and attack my faith or ask me about my faith or even maybe put me on trial for my faith. I don't know what I'd say. What's Jesus say? Don't worry about it. Not don't prepare for it. Prepare for it, but don't worry about it. Because on that day, the Spirit will start speaking through you. Will recall to you all the scriptures. And you're just going to find yourself giving all these defense of your faith in such a wonderful way and regurgitating all these scriptures. Well, what happens in Acts 4 is exactly that. Peter and James and all of them get hauled into the middle of court. And what do they do? They don't apologize. They don't soft pedal anything. Peter gets on a soapbox and delivers one of the most fiery sermons you've ever heard. He could not be shut up in that moment. He could not, he could not be quiet for the Spirit speaking through him and testifying through him. And he put them on trial. All these religious leaders. He's, he was accusing them of, of, of killing Jesus Christ, of betraying their Messiah, of not, of not bowing down and asking for forgiveness of their sins. And, and then the, the religious leaders, I love this, they're like, well, fine, whatever, just don't speak of Jesus anymore. And they're like, no, we're going to speak of him every day of our life. And so they get thrown back out into the streets. And they go and they preach some more. Look at that transformation. What's the only thing that's different? They have the Spirit. When you have the Spirit and Scripture, and if that's good enough for the apostles, if that's good enough for the psalmist, it should be pretty sufficient for you. Otherwise, your standards are maybe a little too high. It should be all you need in that hour that you have the Scriptures and you have the Spirit. When your faith comes under attack or when your faith comes under question, you just go, God, give me the right words to say. Give me the boldness not to hold back, but in gentleness and respect to share my faith. Time and again throughout history, we have seen ordinary men and women of faith come in front of kings and courts and even executioners, and they have boldly shared their faith. And I believe 100% of the time, that is the Spirit speaking through them. That maybe they were scared up to that moment, but in that moment, suddenly the Spirit empowers their lives, and they are speaking truth. They are speaking testimony. They are giving scripture, and they are leading other people to Jesus Christ. There's no reason you can't believe that that won't happen to you. That gives us such great faith, such great hope. Because I think a lot of us get really scared when the thought of somebody asking you or confronting you about your faith and going, I don't want to be that person. That should be for the missionaries and the pastors and the evangelists to deal with. Peter says, no, be ready because that day will come, that opportunity will come for you to share your faith. On that day, we want to have a perfect comeback. And that perfect comeback isn't having some sarcastic quip, having that, that witty response, but rather the perfect comeback is opening up the scriptures to what God has put into your heart and sharing with gentleness and respect, but firmness and boldness, the faith and the life and the truth and the promise that he's given to you. The psalmist says, look at the blessings God has given to me. I'm going to share the news of those blessings, share the gospel with kings. You can do no less, because that's the promise God's going to make to you, that he will be there for you. He will speak through you. That's his promise, and he will not break it. Let's pray. Dear Lord, the Bible says you do not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of boldness. It's not our boldness, Lord. We know it's yours because we are sometimes the biggest scaredy cats in the world. But Lord, we know you are bold for you. You are zealous for your truth. And you use us in amazing ways to share the truth of your word. So Lord, we just pray, take my life. Take my life and let it be consecrated for you. Let me be your spokesperson. Help us to resolve right now to study your word, 
to get it inside of us to prepare and Lord, just to trust you on the day that you ask us to share. In your name, amen. Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? If not, please click the link in the upper right-hand corner to view our message, the most important video you will ever watch. Join us for worship Sunday mornings at 10.30 a.m., either in person at 2595 Elmwood Avenue in Kenmore, New York, or on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash KNOXEPC. Find past sermons on our website knoxepc.com forward slash sermons. Stay up to date with Knox Church. To receive our monthly newsletter, email office at knoxepc.com. If you need prayer, send an email to pastor at knoxepc.com. You can request text alerts by texting 734-968-1847. Knox Sunday School happens every Sunday at 9 a.m. for kids grades kindergarten through 8th, and for adults of all ages. Email office at knoxepc.com for more information. Knox Evangelical Presbyterian Church. Our motto is truthful teaching, and graceful living. We are committed to growing in the knowledge of Jesus, serving Him by serving others, and loving the body of Christ. To donate to Knox Church via PayPal, visit knoxepc.com and click on giving at the top of the page, or scan the QR code above with your smartphone or tablet. Special thanks to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the members of Knox Church. Without them, this outreach wouldn't be possible.